all glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who has borne all our sins and has cleansed every stain. I am so glad for the lovely Lord Jesus. I invite your attention, please, to the book of Romans again this morning. We're going to the first chapter. We looked last Sunday morning at verse number one. We're going to make a lot more progress today. We're going all the way through verse seven. So uh, it's exciting to see we made a little more progress today. Romans chapter one is where we're at. We're looking together at verses two through seven, but I'm going to read verse one in just a moment as we stand to read God's word. If you're able to stand, I invite you to stand with us. This These seven verses are one sentence in the original language, equated to one paragraph in the paragraphical breakdowns of the book. This epistle begins with these words, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, which he hath promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship, For obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. Among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ. To all that be in Rome. Beloved of God. Called to be saints. Grace to you. And peace from God our Father. And the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you bow your head with me and let's pray together. Father, we are so very grateful this morning for the opportunity to open the scriptures, the holy scriptures, the scriptures that you inspired men to write over a period of hundreds of years. And yet this book today has but one message. That message is your glorious gospel that all people everywhere can be born again because of your love and mercy and grace extended to us through the gift of your son and i pray today you'd encourage our hearts as believers i pray you'll convict the heart of every sinner bring them to jesus today i pray in his name and for his sake amen you may be seated thank you so much for standing we began looking at this book last sunday morning under this overarching theme of the foundation of our faith. Uh, Many people have called this book the Constitution of Christianity. Others have called it the Christian Manifesto and some other titles throughout the course of time. What this book does is it presents and explains to all of us the foundational biblical New Testament doctrines. Uh, This book will lay out for us what we need to know about our sin, what we need to know about our Savior, what we need to know about our salvation, what we will need to know about our sanctification, what we will need to know about our separation, what we will need to know about our service and our sending. Last Sunday morning, we looked together at verse number one of chapter number one of the book of Romans under this thought, the testimony of a Christian. And Paul here is introducing himself to these people. These are people that he had never seen, many of them. We know that some of them that their name we'll find when we get to the end of the book have he had some acquaintance with, but most of them he had never met. Yet he says in verse 11, he longed to see them. He wanted to be able to spend time with these believers in the imperial city of Rome, and yet he had not yet been afforded that opportunity. And so the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write this epistle to them as a declaration of our faith in Jesus Christ. And introducing himself last week in chapter 1 and verse 1, we saw Paul, that is, we saw him as changed by Jesus, no longer Saul, the big one, 
Paul, the little one, it spoke of his salvation. Then we saw in that next phrase, a servant of Jesus Christ, that he was chained to Jesus and lived his life in submission to the Lord. Now, the next phrase, called to be an apostle, declares that as Christians, we are commissioned by Jesus, are sent out to be a witness for him. And lastly, he spoke of his separ- that he's separated unto the gospel of God, and that is that he was to be separated for God, unto God, for his glory. And so I'm going to, I'm going to use the last words of verse 1 as my title for this morning's message. Notice what he says there in the last phrase of verse 1. Separated unto the gospel of God. Now, if you're familiar with the writings of the Apostle Paul, and we'll not go through them, but if you were to flip over throughout them, you would find that a normal greeting in a Pauline epistle is Paul identifying himself as the human author, and maybe in all the books except for Romans, he would list some people who are in service of the king with him. And then you would find him addressing who he is writing, and then you would find him speaking to them a greeting. That greeting is the same as we'll look at together this morning in all the epistles except for the pastoral epistles, which would be 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. He adds one component in those three epistles. But all the rest of them, he says to them, grace and peace. And and that was his normal writing. But but that's not what he does in Romans. In, In Romans, We have an extended greeting. It covers these seven verses that we've already read together this morning from God's Word. But but I'll show you how easily it would have been for verses 2 through 6 not to be here. Would you look back at verse 1 again with me? Verse 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. Verse 7, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're familiar with the other epistles, you would know that that's basically how all of them are, began. And yet, in this letter, Paul extensively talks about the subject of the gospel of God. Now, I was not there when Paul wrote these words, but I think that what may have happened in the spirit of Paul, when he wrote those four words, the gospel of God, he began to ponder on that gospel and extended this greeting to speak to all of us, both the initial readers at Rome and those of us who are still studying this book almost 2,000 years later, of the power of the gospel. I believe the key verse in this this book is verse 16 in chapter 1. He said, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, To the Jew first and also to the Greek. And when he wrote for the first time the gospel of God, under inspiration of God's spirit, God prompted him to continue to speak to his readers of the power of the gospel. Now, if there's anyone who's ever lived on planet earth who could be easily overwhelmed by the power of the gospel, it's the Apostle Paul. Many of us are familiar with his testimony. We have read it. It's recorded for us in this actual happening in Acts chapter 9. He repeats it two more times in the book of Acts. He speaks of it in some other epistles that he was inspired to write of God to churches. It was the gospel that had taken Paul from a persecutor and enemy of Christ to a preacher 
and an emissary for Christ. It was the gospel that transformed him from darkness to light. It was the gospel that took him from death to life. It was the gospel that took him from a dead relationship, a dead religion to a living relationship. It was the gospel that moved him from guilt to grace. No wonder when he wrote those words, the gospel of God, he then paused and began to share with us the power of God's gospel. But you know the wonderful thing about the gospel of God is it's just as powerful this morning as it was when Paul wrote these words. You know what's amazing about the gospel of God? There are people just like Brother Ron Braswell all over this auditorium this morning, if you were given the opportunity, you too could give testimony of the transforming power of God's gospel. You could tell of the day when you were brought out of the shackles of your sin and given the joy of Jesus within. See, the gospel of God is not for a few select people. The gospel of God is not for a certain era of time. The gospel of God this morning will do for anyone who will believe what the gospel of God did for Paul. He shares with us here this morning in our text two aspects of this gospel. First of all, I want you to notice with me, please, the contents. It's interesting how Paul then speaks. He speaks in a parenthetical thought. You will notice verse number two has a set of parentheses, one at the beginning and the other at the end. Because he thinks about the reality and shares with us the understanding that this gospel was not a new revelation. This gospel was not a new idea. This gospel was not something that all of a sudden appeared in New Testament days. Paul very plainly says in verse number two, it was promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. In other words, the contents of the gospel of God are the fulfillment of the promises of God. He had promised afore, he says, by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. What had he promised? He had promised that he would send the Messiah. He promised that he would send the Christ. He promised that he would send the Savior. He promised that he would send a Redeemer. He promised that he would receive all of those who would receive him. Listen to these words of Jesus while he was here on earth. They're recorded for us in the fifth chapter of John's gospel. It's the 39th verse. This is what Jesus said. Search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. Now, please understand that when Paul speaks of the scriptures. And when Jesus was speaking of the scriptures. He's speaking of the Old Testament. You know, there's been, a, there's been a modern idea that's come to pass that the Old Testament has no significance in the day that you and I are living in. There's just one problem with that. Nobody told God about it. No, the Holy Scriptures, the Word of God. Matter of fact, you can go to the very beginning of the, of the Old Testament, the third chapter of the book of Genesis, and for the first time, God promises a Savior. Verse 15, you can go all the way to the last book of the Old Testament, the fourth chapter of Malachi and verse 2, and one last time, God promises that he will send the son of righteousness. 
See, God throughout the ages, when he created man, even before he created man, knew that man would need a redeemer. That you and I would sin, that we would rebel against God, that we would go our own way. And thereby, there must be a remedy for sin. And so what God did is God promised it afore by his holy prophets in the scriptures. We this morning would take the time or could take the time. We could go from page to page of the Old Testament and we would see the clarity of the sending of the Son. I mean types and symbols. Think about it with me. Noah's day. The world was so corrupt, God said, I'm going to destroy the whole earth. But one man found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And God spared that one man and his family by placing them in an ark of safety. What's God doing? God was promising a foretime by his prophet in the Holy Scripture. He'd send his son. You, you could go just a, another book over to the book of Exodus and his people are in captivity in Egypt. God's tried to get them free over and again and Pharaoh has refused. But finally the 10th plague comes and what does he do? He tells the people that if they'll put the blood on the lintel and the doorpost of their home, that when he sees the blood, he will pass over them. What's Passover. It's predicting that one who would come, whom John identified as the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. Amen. You could go on through the Old Testament and see the manna, see the tabernacle, see the sacrificial system. All of them simply afore telling us that he would send his son. Listen to Paul's words, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. He said, for I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Where do you get it from? Keep reading. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Now listen to me. The New Testament is in the process of being written, but it is not written the scriptures are the Old Testament. It's a four by his prophets. He said, I received how Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day. This is what Paul said, according to the scriptures. <laughs> Paul said it was all fulfilled in Jesus. He makes that so very plain. Look at the next verse with me. Verse 3. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The gospel is the good news that God sent his son into this world to die on the cross to save us from our sins. The good news this morning is all about Jesus. Amen. Paul highlights it. In verse 3, his incarnation. The word incarnation simply means in flesh. As a matter of fact, if you go down to the end of the verse, the third verse, you'll see he wrote this phrase, according to the flesh. John 1.14 records it this way. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The second person of the Godhead took the form of a man. Now the theologians call that the hypostatic union. You say, what does that mean? Just simply means Jesus is God. Jesus is God. The divine one became human flesh. As a matter of fact, notice how Paul states it there in the middle of verse number three. He was made of the seed of David. 
Now, we studied the life of David uh, a few months ago, and when we got to 2 Samuel chapter 7, we read and studied together what's called the Davidic covenant. And in the Davidic covenant, God promised that as long as the world stood, there would be one of the seed of David who would be the king of of Israel and ultimately the king of the earth. It's quite interesting. You just write these verses down. We won't go to them. But it's quite interesting that the New Testament begins with the statement about Jesus in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1 that he is of the seed of David. It's, it's quite interesting that the New Testament ends out and in the last chapter, in the last book, Verse 16 of chapter 22 of the Revelation, once again, we are pointed to the seed or the offspring, it says there, of David. Why? Because he was clearly saying that his lineage could be traced back to David in Matthew chapter 1. And he was clearly saying that when he, Jesus, sits on the throne of, uh, in Jerusalem, he will sit there as the fulfillment of the promise of God aforetime by the prophets in the holy scriptures. <laughs> you know, I'm glad this morning you and I have in our hands a copy of the holy scriptures. I'm thankful that God wrote those 39 books in the Old Testament, but I am also thankful he wrote those 27 books in the New Testament. And you and I this morning can know that Jesus Christ is the God man. He is 100% God, 100% man. That little phrase there at the end of verse number three, according to the flesh, reminds us that it was the activity of God who brought Jesus into this world. It's interesting. There's another lineage of Jesus. The other lineage of Jesus is Luke chapter three. I think it starts about verse 21, 22, somewhere along there, goes to the end of the chapter. It's interesting that, that Luke's genealogy of Jesus doesn't go back just to David like Matthew. You know where Luke's genealogy goes back? It goes all the way back to Adam. The first man created by God and placed in the Garden of Eden. Well, what is God doing? God is saying, I want you to understand that I've kept the promises I made for by the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So, so verse 3 talks about his incarnation, his humiliation. Verse number 4 talks about his resurrection or his exaltation. Not only did Jesus come into the world, and I thank God for Christmas. Not only did Jesus die on the cross, and I thank God for the day that he died. But I'm glad this morning that he came alive from the dead. <laughs> If he had just died and laid in a tomb, you and I would be without hope, without God, without possibility of redemption. But he made him flesh. But notice verse number four. He didn't make him the son of God. Why? Because he was already the son of God. There's never been a time when Jesus wasn't. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning, Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, God created the heaven and the earth. God is that three-person deity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He was not made the Son of God. No, what does Paul say? Paul said he was declared... He was manifested. It's interesting. The word declared, the root of it in verse 4, and the word separated up in verse number 1 are in the same family. If you were here last Sunday, I mentioned that that word separated was the word from which we get our English word horizon. You know what a horizon is? A horizon is where the earth meets the sky. You look out across the, across, the, across the world and you can see the horizon. I was in West Texas this past week. I promise you, you can see every horizon you want to see in West Texas. They don't have but two trees in the county I was in. I think they were artificial. <laughs> the wind blows somewhere between 150 and 200 miles an hour every day. Messed my hair up several times. But the horizon is what separates the earth from the sky. Well, let me tell you what separates Jesus from any other man. 
he not only died, but he was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. You know what the distinguishing mark of Jesus' deity is? Not that he died, not that he was buried, but that he rose again, never to die again. You say, oh, there's some other people in the Bible rose again. Yeah, but every one of them died again. Jesus is alive. That's the reason in Revelation chapter 1, he identified himself as he who has the keys of death, hell, and the grave. I am he that was dead, and yet I live, he says. He was powerfully shown. I love that little phrase there, with power. According to the spirit of holiness. Isn't that interesting? At the end of verse number 3, when he was speaking of his incarnation and humiliation, he said it was according to the flesh. He became a man, just like you and I are men or women or young people today. But, but, but when he was resurrected, it was the, by the spirit of holiness. What is the spirit of holiness? Well, the spirit of holiness is the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, a little bit later in this same book, we won't go there, just jot it down. But Romans chapter 8 and verse 11 says, But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Hey, listen, you know how Jesus came out of the grave? Jesus came out of the grave by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know how you and I are carried out of darkness into light, how to death into life? It's through the power of the Holy Spirit. We're born again, not of our own will, not of what we might do, but we're born again when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ and by the power of his Spirit. Uh, we're made new, alive in him. Paul said it wasn't according to the flesh that he was raised. It was according to the spirit of holiness. So after giving us the contents, then he speaks of the converts. It's interesting, the change. I want you to notice it with me, and then we'll come back and I'll mention it maybe again. But look at verse 5. By whom, that next word is we, all right? So we is a plural pronoun. We means not just me, but you as well, all right? Now go to verse number six. Among whom are ye. So it's interesting that Paul makes a distinguishing between we and ye, and I'll tell you why I believe that. I believe in verse number five, Paul is rejoicing that he himself was a convert. <laughs> He's expressing the thought that he himself has been born again. He is reminding us that it's not of us, though. Look at it. Look at it, verse 5 with me. By whom, and by whom goes all the way back to the Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, the Son of God, the, pre, the, the antecedent is, is Jesus. By whom... We have received grace and apostleship. There's not a convert to Christianity on this earth today apart from grace. This is how Paul states it in Ephesians 2, 4. By grace are ye saved through faith, that not of yourselves, because it's grace, he goes on to say, it is the gift of God. Now, apart from grace this morning, we're all hell bound. Yes, sir. That's right. Apart from grace this morning, we're all dead in our trespasses and sins. Right. Uh, apart from grace this morning, we have no privilege afforded us of the new birth. Grace is that unmerited love and favor of God extended to sinners. How do we receive that grace? Look at it right there in the next phrase, for obedience to the faith. 
How do we receive grace? Through our obedience to the faith. What, what the word obedience there means to hear under. The, the word obedience there implies submission to what we have heard. So what, what did we hear? We heard the gospel. Many of us this morning in this room, if we were given opportunity, could testify of a day when we were confronted face to face with the truth of the gospel. What's the truth of the gospel? The truth of the gospel is we're all sinners. As a matter of fact, many of us, when we share the gospel, we share most of it right out of the book of Romans. It says, as it is written, verse, chapter 3 and verse 10, there's none righteous, no, not one. Verse 23 says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We were confronted with the fact we were sinners, just like, like Ron testified this morning in the video. We, we were confronted with the fact that the wages of our sin, chapter 6 and verse 23, is death, separation from God forever. When we came to understand that God didn't want us to be separated from him because Romans 5, 8 says, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He suffered my death. He suffered your death. He, he bore our separation in his body on the tree. And, and because of that, then the latter part of Romans 6, 23 is true. For the wages of sin's death, the first part, the last part says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And then he says in chapter 10 and verse 9 that if thou shalt confess, that word means agree with God, if shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, you got to agree Jesus is who he says he is. He is Christ. He is Lord. He is the Savior of the world. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him, what? From the dead. That work that he did so powerfully. Thou shalt confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Believe in your heart. God's raised him from the dead. This is what God says. Thou shalt be saved. When you and I hear the truth and submit to that truth, then God receives us into his family. But isn't it interesting what Paul ties in here? It's quite interesting to me in verse number five. Look at it again. By whom we have received grace and apostleship. Now, if you were here last Sunday, we looked at that word last Sunday. It's up in chapter 1, verse 1. It's that third portion of chapter 1 and verse 1, an apostle, called to be an apostle. What, what does that word mean? It means a sent one. As a matter of fact, he, he even says where we're sent in verse 5. We're sent among all nations. He, he even tells us why we're sent. We're sent for his name. That, that word for means on behalf of his name. What are we? We're sent because we've been saved to tell others that they too can be saved. Paul will get to that thought in chapter 10. How shall they hear without a preacher? He says, by, by him, Jesus, we receive grace, salvation. We receive the apostleship, being sent. Among all nations, nobody, nobody anywhere, listen to me, the gospel's not limited this morning. It's for every place, it's for every race. We're sent on his behalf to share with them that they too can be part of the converts of Jesus. He says, uh, I'm in that number. But then in verse 6 and 7, he shifts it. He said, you're in that number. Now, remember that many of these people he's never met. But interesting enough, he says, verse 6, among whom are ye also the called of Jesus Christ? Now, now, what does that phrase remind us? It reminds us that it's not only Jesus who does the saving, it's Jesus who does the calling. Jesus said it himself while he was here on earth, recorded for us in the sixth chapter of John. No man comes to the Father except he draw him. Now, now the good news is this. God's invitation is for everybody. But because Jesus said it this way, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Here he is, the whole world. He loves them all. He loves you. He loves me. All that whosoever. Yes, sir. Whosoever. Whosoever. <laughs> 
whosoever, that's everybody, that's anybody, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Paul said, now you are some of those that Jesus called and you believed. And he says, I love there's a couple of phrases here, just precious phrases. We don't have a whole lot of time to spend on, but in verse 7, he reminded them that they are beloved of God. What, what that means is it's simply that God loves them. God loves you. We just, I just quoted John three sixteen. God loves everyone. But in a special sense, they're beloved. In other words, they're in the family. They've chosen to receive the Son. And when you receive the Son, then chapter 8 of Romans, he's going to tell us, you become an heir with Christ. An heir of God, joint heir with Christ. So as converts and believers, we're beloved. As converts and believers, look at it. Verse number 7, we're saints, called to be saints. There's no such thing as a limited sainthood. That's a false doctrine. Nobody has to be dead for a certain amount of time before they could ever get voted in. No, at the moment you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you become part of his sainthood. Covered by his blood, redeemed by his righteousness. The word saint there means to be set apart. It's from the Greek word hagios, holy. See, at the moment you and I were saved... We were set apart from sin. We were set apart to the Savior. We become his possession and dwelt by his spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19. What? No, you're not. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, and ye are not your own. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and your spirits, which are God's. That moment I was redeemed, I was indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And today, I belong to that thrice holy God. So what I have in him this morning as a convert, look at the end of verse number seven, grace. There it is again. He's already mentioned it once. He mentions it again. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And this morning as a believer, as a convert, It's a follower of Jesus Christ. We have grace and peace. But you know what's interesting? Grace was a very common Greek greeting in that day. They would meet each other and would use a form of the the Christian word grace, which is charis. They would use charo and and they they would greet. Peace was a very common Hebrew greeting. They used the Hebrew word shalom. Many Orthodox Jews still speak peace to each other when they meet each other. But you know what? This morning as Christians, we're neither Jew nor Gentile. We're not either Greek nor Jew. We're all one. And through and in Jesus Christ, we have both grace and peace. You you may be in this room this morning. You say, man, I'd like to have grace and peace in my life. Well, let me just tell you, you're Your goodness cannot acquire it for you. Our government cannot legislate it for you. We live in a world that's filled with confusion and chaos. But isn't it wonderful this morning if you're a Christian? That in the midst of all the confusion, in the midst of all the chaos, there's grace. There's peace. Grace. Peace. I shared John Wesley's testimony last Sunday as we began to, the study of this book. He went, came to America to be a missionary. On the way home, defeated. Got around a bunch of believers and in the storm on the, on the sea, on the Atlantic Ocean. He was overcome, overwhelmed with fear. But those believers were singing and praying and praising God. And he got back to England. He went to one of their meetings. There trusted Jesus as his Savior. Why? Because their testimony spoke of grace and peace. And and the reality is this. You you and I can find both grace and peace in Jesus. I had the privilege on a couple occasions to hear Dr. Vance Havner. I still enjoy reading Dr. Havner. He 
has multiple books of sermons. One of those sermons, Dr. Habner told the story of a, of a man who came home from work one day, and when he got home, he said his, his wife was visibly shaken. So trying to be a loving, caring husband, he said to her, honey, what's wrong? She said, the strangest thing happened to me today. She said, I was busy in the kitchen and there came a knock, knock on the door. I went to the door and standing there at the door was a complete stranger. He introduced himself and then he asked me a question. Ma'am, do you know Jesus? She said, I didn't know what to say to him, so I just shut the door and went back. He said, well, honey, why didn't you tell him that you sing in the choir every Sunday? Or, or, or why didn't you tell him that you're the president of the Ladies' Aid Society at our church? Or why didn't you tell him that you collect Christmas toys for needy children every year? Why, why didn't you tell him all those things? She said, because that's not what he asked me. He asked me, do you know Jesus? I want to ask you a question. Do you know Jesus? I'm not asking you, do you know about him? Do you know of him? I'm asking you this morning, do you know him? If you know him, you know both grace and peace. But if you don't know him this morning, whatever you're using to try to bring that grace and peace to your heart and your spirit, it won't work. It's only the gospel of God that brings grace and peace. If you don't know him today, God is doing just what he did to these Romans. He's calling you. He's confronting you with your need to know him. And then those of us that are saved, He's reminding us that having received grace, we've also been given apostleship. The responsibility to be a carrier of the gospel. Let's bow our heads for prayer, please.